Now we're going to turn to the subject of statistics, and in particular we're going to talk about a particular issue called the flaw of averages. Now, statistical thinking is a very simple process in some respects. It really has three principles. All work occurs in a series of interconnected processes. Variation exists in those processes, and we can use that data to learn about how the processes perform. The third principle is that understanding and reducing variation are the principal ways to improve performance in both business and process. So profound knowledge is all about how the process operates, and we can improve profound knowledge if we can reduce variation. So there's three questions that we want to ask ourselves about statistics. The first is a question, what do you want to accomplish? What are you trying to uh, do? What's the business reason or the operational reason or the criteria for conducting a change in, a, in order to improve a process? The second is, by what method do you want to accomplish your objective? Now, this means that you have to define the means or the process of measurement and testing that's used to demonstrate that you've actually achieved the objective that you've set out. The third question is, how will you know that you've accomplished your objective? This is the question that says you should operationally define the measure, the process of measurement you use, and the testing procedure, and what's going to be the decision rule or the criterion you make to say, yes, a change has actually happened that is the one that we set as our goal to be accomplished. Now, when we take a look at data, we see that there's really a couple of different ways of looking at it. For instance, if I'm taking a look at this data here for the months of March and April in a particular year, I could see it, show it as what management saw. It's the, the red and the blue bar charts. And if I just take a look at that, I don't see any difference. However, if I look within the process, the customer experience is very different than that summary for what the average data was for the two months. As a matter of fact, if I take a look at that bar chart, the management saw, that was the summary of the averages of all the daily information from each of those months. And in reality, what the customer experienced was the variation or the spread, not the average. The average is only a summary statistic. It's not a good way to be able to understand what happens at the detailed level in the process. So we see variation occurs in everything. No two things are exactly alike, whether you're talking about a McDonald's French fry or two ballpoint pens that come off a production line. None of them are exactly alike. But many times, we can't see the differences. We can't, for the, the sake of the lack of money, time, or the measurement system, we can't even observe the differences. Maybe we don't even care about the differences. As long as the pen writes, it doesn't matter to me if the ink is a slightly different color than another ballpoint pen. So as I'm looking at variation, what I see is that there is a natural range of process performance. And when management looks at things and they say, on average, our performance is seven days. Okay, well then we look at the data. So take a look at the data here. We see that the maximum range for performance in delivery to customer is 1.9 years. So if we're on average seven days, our customers should be happy if we promise them 10 days. But in reality, there's lots of instances here of occasions where we go much beyond the 10 days to the point of 1.9 years. I can only assume that customer is gonna be very, very, very unhappy. So what is statistical thinking? It's a process. We begin by asking questions. We identify tools and methods and activities that will deliver us answers. And then we go to the next level of detail and we have more questions and the next level of detail. And finally, we get to what we could say is a root cause. And when we affect that, we can actually have permanent change in the process. Now, when we see data, we see things in two different ways. We see central tendency. This is what the average describes. And so we also see variance describing the spread or consistency of the data around a process. And we need both to be able to describe the total performance. Because when we look at this, when we're taking a look at data, there's only a few things we can change. We can shift the average, we can reduce the variation, or we can do both. And so as we're looking at that, we say, okay, what do we mean by these things? So if we talk about averages, for instance, one of the things we observe is data tends to cluster around some central tendency. 
We call this an arithmetic mean. When we average all the data, we add it all up and divide by the total number of observations. We call it the median when we go from the top to the bottom in ranked order. We say, what's the middle one or the 50th percentile? We call it the mode when we go and we say, what's the most frequently occurring number? So central tendency is actually trying to describe where is the mass of the data. But as Jack Welch said, he said, the mean, the average almost never happens. He said 50% of the data is above the average, 50% of the data is below the average. That means there's nothing that's average. So that can be very true sometimes. We also take a look that we have also another observation. Data tends to be spread around that central tendency, and that provides us an indication of the consistency of the process. Again, Welsh said, truth is in the variation. So dispersion, or the spread of the data, is how we show how one process differs from the other. And it's talking about the degree of consistency it has in performance around that measure of central tendency. Well, how do we uh, calculate these things? Well, we can go through all of the formulas, but perhaps it's just easier to think about this in terms of what's happening with a simple set of numbers. So here we have a set of numbers, 10 of them. And if we take a look and we put them in column X here, so N is the number of the sample, so we have 1 through 10, and then we have this big sigma sign, which stands for summation. So we add them all together, and we get 45. If we divide by 10, we get the arithmetic average, which is also called the mean of 4.5. Now, if we want to understand how much spread we have, we're going to take that center mean as an indicator and say, how much is data on above or below that indication? And so we're going to subtract the data from the mean, or the mean from the data. So by, by uh, tradition, what we do is we take the data indicator and subtract the mean. So we get the second set of numbers. Now, I can't add them up and divide by 10 in order to understand the average. Because if I do that, they're all referenced to the same point. So this will end up dividing a number into zero, because there is no difference. They're going to be equally split on each side of the mean. So mathematically, what we do is we square those numbers. And what that's going to do is it's going to change the scale, but it will then give us a number that when we add it up, we can operate on it mathematically. So we square each of those numbers. We add it up, and we get 82.50. In statistics, we call that the sum of squares. This is an indication of how much variance exists or how much deviation exists on a squared scale from the average. Now, we don't divide by 10. If we did, we would have something that in engineering we call the root mean squared standard deviation. But that is an optimistic estimator. If we take a look here, we're dividing by n minus 1. So this is degrees of freedom. And the reason we take this out is we have now referenced all of these 10 numbers to a number that was derived from that set of numbers, the average. And so we've lost a degree of freedom. This is stuck on our measurement scale at one particular point, and the other nine points are sort of around it. So we divide this by nine, and then we get the variance. So variance is a number that is the, uh, if you will, just dividing by nine in the squared scale. Now, if we want to return this to the regular scale, we have to take the square root. So because we squared it, we take the square root. Now we're back in the original scale. Now, just for, for information, mathematically, we can work on the sum of squares. We can work on the variance. But because this is under the radical sign, we can't actually do any work in that in terms of mathematics. So if we take a look, we see most processes actually don't have a normal distribution. If you think about it, all time processes are actually shaped like a Poisson distribution or an Erlang or a gamma distribution. They have a long tail. And that's because we have a zero timeline. So for instance, if we're thinking about how fast can a bank teller serve a queue of people, each person coming there, the bank teller is trying to do it as fast as possible. But then somebody comes along, and they're taking a much longer time. And then the bank teller goes back, driving it down to zero. Then somebody else takes a longer time. And what we start seeing is these long times create a long tail. And the behavior in that long tail is not what we're looking for. That's undesirable behavior. So how does this relate to Six Sigma? Well, we can see that we can use Sigma as a measurement process. And what we're talking about is defects in terms of parts per million. A Six Sigma process has just basically three defects per million parts. 
A one sigma process has 690,000 de defects per million parts. A three sigma process has 66,800 defects per million parts. And so those are very high defect levels. Now, if we want to describe what's really happening in the organization, we don't need to go to the sigma scale. What we can do is just take a look at what's really happening. Now, if I want to explain the statistics, the mean is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. It gives me location on the performance scale, but it doesn't tell me about the consistency. So I have to have both the mean and the standard deviation or the variance or the sum of squares to be able to understand what's going on. And the thing we see is that the easiest way to improve performance is by reducing the long tail of the performance measures. So how does this work? Let's give you an example. We're looking at a data set here in terms of the average call answer time at a call center. And what we see in this given week that the average call answer time is three to nine minutes long. Oh, that's terrible, you say. Well, yes, it is. But how do we improve it? Well, we take a look at this, and what I have is the averages for each day. I don't know what to improve. It looks like Saturday and Sunday things got worse. But I don't know what the volume is. I don't understand the distributions, and I don't understand where there is an opportunity to improve. So I can look at this data a little differently. So if I show you this chart here, we're looking at a box plot. And the box plot, that green box in the center, is the middle 50% of the data. And those lines above and below, they're called whiskers, and that's 25% of the data. The line in the middle is the median. It's the 50th percentile point. And that thing that looks like a, a circle with a plus sign in it, I, I sometimes think of that as a bomb site, that's the arithmetic median, that the mean. That is the average of all the data. This one above the da data, this little asterisk, that is a small um, deviation that is out, considered an outlier. It's greater than 5% in terms of the continuous measurement variable. So it's going to be an unusual observation. So let's go back and take a look at the call center summary data instead of the average data using the box plots. Now, first, what can we learn from the measure? Well, we can figure out, is the measure any good? Is the performance good? We can figure out the operating range. We should be able to see the limits of distribution uh, of performance, what type of distribution this has, and is there a pattern to change? So all of those are things we want to learn from the statistics. So let's look at this, this call center. So here now we see Monday through Friday. The orange dots were the averages that were reported before. And what we see is these box plots, and we see, ah, there's a very big difference between these days. And we look at Friday, and we see the average was four minutes, but the shortest service time was five seconds, and somebody actually stayed holding on the line for an hour and 10 minutes, waiting for someone to answer the phone. So what we see is, as we look at this data, there are two components to the data. One is a systematic result. That's the box plot. We can see the distribution. We can represent that as a mathematical formula. The unpredictable part of the distribution is this, what we're going to call here, a long tail. And here, there is no distribution. This is random data, errors that are outside of the, the realm of calculation or estimation. Now, there may be reasons for those errors, but we can't see them and we can't predict them in a mathematical format. Now, we've talked about enumerative data and we've talked about analytic data. So what we've been seeing so far is enumerative data. And if I want to understand what's going on, I need to take a look at this data using the individual's charts. Why? Because the individual chart will show me the analytic view or the time history. So let's just take that one Friday and look at it in terms of an individual's chart. And what we see here is that there's a pattern of data. Now, we say this is time history, but this is actually all of the phone calls coming into that center, 23,381 in one day. And what we see is that this first group here, up to around 2,000 calls, that was between midnight and 8 a.m. And between 2,000 and about 17,000, that was the day between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. And we see that there's a couple of patterns here. There's a peak in the mid-morning. It drops, and that drop that goes below that line, that's the noon break, so people are going to lunch. Then we have the afternoon. There's a spike, and that's just about 4.30, and people are calling before they go home. And then we see it drops. And in the evening, what we see is a bimodal distribution. Some data at the very bottom, and then a lot of these red dots above the line. 
So what we see is that these long calls, these long waiting times, are actually happening in the evening. So what we're seeing now is we have to ask ourselves a question about rational subgroups. What's different between the day calls, the morning calls, and the night calls? Why are the reasons for those calls being taking so much longer to answer? And we can start dividing the data and seeing what is different. And one of the things we found out when we did this was these long calls were because this phone call center was operated by students at a, a, a university not to be named here in Finland. And as we looked at this, what we saw was that those calls were the transfer calls to the supervisor, and the supervisor couldn't handle all the answers because they didn't have the capability to keep answering all the calls that came in. But management had set this up so the students weren't trained and they couldn't give all the answers. So the students were told, if you can't answer it, transfer it to the supervisor. So this was re resulting in frustration on the part of the supervisor, I'm sure, as well as long answer times for people to get the answers and probably also frustrating the customers. And so what we see is when we have these long tails, there are a couple of options. One is we should work to eliminate those tails. Can we get rid of the reasons? Are there things we could do once we understand the rational subgroups and the cause for why they came about? And then if we, we've gotten rid of those long tails, the next thing we can do is work on the deviation, improving the natural standard deviation of the process. If that's not good enough and we don't have enough capability, then the final thing we can do is totally redesign the process. At that time, we're getting outside of the job description of a standard greenbelt level competence. However, as an industrial engineer, you may find that you're still involved in that process. So, in summary, the flaw of averages is stated this way. Average data is, on average, wrong.